the march of time. Among the least dispensable adjuncts of modern civilization to the average U.S. citizen is canned music, which attends him through all his waking hours and wherever he goes. The American reluctance to endure a moment's silence has been the fortune of the record industry whose job is the somewhat precarious one of keeping 20 million U.S. turntables profitably supplied with records. An operation which requires a nice combination of business acumen, gambling sense, technical skill, and sheer lunacy. was us. Sounded like a cap pistol. Charlie, I told you to quit chewing that gum. All right, boys, we'll do another one. Quiet. Stand by. Roll them. are some quarter of a billion recordings sold each year, ranging from the loftiest of classics to low-down gut bucket, with 80% or so consisting of popular tunes played sweet and smooth. A small but intense minority of the industry's customers are rare record fans, many of them addicts of hot jazz in its more erudite forms, such as today's bebop. Members of this consecrated band are apt to spend much of their time shuffling through second-hand shops in search of rare records. Preserved on wax in such shops is the whole history of the industry back to the turn of the century, when the Edison talking machine was the newest scientific marvel. Hallelujah, chorus from the Messiah, played by the Edison Concert Band. The industry did not begin in earnest until Victor and its great rival Columbia put disc-shaped recordings on the market and planted the talking record firmly in the American front parlor. Well, long last summer, Reuben Hoskins, that is Esri Hoskins' boy, he came home from college and brought one of them newfangled bicycle machines home with him. Well, I think ever since that time, the whole town of Pumpkin Center has got the bicycle fever. <laughs> to its famed trademark, Victor proudly rallied an impressive lineup of concert and operatic stars headed by the great Enrico Caruso. Caruso and the well-loved John McCormick were soon neighborhood fixtures throughout the U.S. Within a few years, popular music became, and ever after remained, the mainstay of the industry. In return, records helped to build the fame of outfits like the Dixieland Jazz Band.
Recording was acoustical and sound was pretty crude, but nobody seemed to care much until the 1920s when competition from the newborn radio industry became tough. By then, a group of scientists at Western Electric, applying the principles of radio to the phonograph, had found out how to reproduce sound electrically with what seemed dazzling fidelity. For the first time, much of the sonority of a big orchestra could be captured on records, and as the industry hastened to change over, Paul Whiteman became the band leader elect of the 1920s. Many Whiteman records were among the best sellers of all time. But despite this, the lush days of the industry were over. Business, which had gradually been dropping off since 1921, came up against the Great Depression and collapsed entirely. The record industry seemed about done for, when campuses all over the land began throbbing to the mellow vibrations of an historic set of tonsils. With Bing Crosby as its big name, and with a line of low-priced records, the brash new Decca company jolted the whole industry into cutting prices to its own collective benefit. Then the jukebox came out of the honky-tonks, where it had long been popular, and as it began catching on with the general public, became an insatiable consumer of records. Sweet Leilani, heavenly flower. Once started upward from its low point of 1932, business kept on improving. Passing the previous all-time peak early in the 40s, Record production rose to an estimated 325 million in 1947. To help in the build-up had come the public's enthusiastic discovery of swing, which launched the present fame of many a hot band like Eddie Condon's. By the 40s, classical recordings, which had accounted for a relatively small part of sales, had in many cases climbed up into the best-seller brackets, as the public got acquainted with great music via the radio. The records of so aristocratic and serious an artist as Yasha Heifetz sold by the millions. Records for children, which up to then no one had thought to bother very much about, started to cut an impressive figure on the profit sheets of record companies. Today they account for well over 10% of all sales. Platters by hillbilly and cowboy singers became phenomenally popular. More than 7 million recordings by Eddie Arnold alone were sold in five years. If I had only known, I'd feel so all alone. I 
I'd have begged down on my knees for you to stay. The gates to paradise swung close before my eyes when the echo of your footsteps died. Riding high with the industry were radio's disc jockeys, most popular and skillful of whom, such as Martin Brock, drew down huge salaries. And now, ladies and gentlemen, over WNEW New York, from your make-believe ballroom, we go to stage two for the sweetest music this side of heaven. That means Guy Lombardo and the Royal Canadians. Guy and the orchestra doing a number they first introduced, titled, Everywhere You Go. Jockey and the jukebox made vast sums for all concerned, except the performers, the American Federation of Musicians had not been slow to realize. In 1942, the union's redoubtable president, James Caesar Petrillo, had won from the industry a royalty on all records and transcriptions. Proceeds were spent on free community music projects, giving jobs to rank-and-file musicians. When the new Taft-Hartley Act made this illegal, Petrillo promptly went to bat. I told a congressional committee last January in Washington that the musicians have no quarrel with the recordings made for home consumption, but we do have a quarrel with the recordings that are made for jukeboxes and radio stations. Certainly no one can expect the musician to continue playing at his own funeral. With the year's end, at Petrillo's order, the record business ground to a stop. For over 11 months, every major recording studio in the United States was closed down, while the industry struggled along on its backlog of masters. Many of the companies used this time to concentrate on the development of better records and better recording methods. Among them was Columbia, in whose laboratories Dr. Peter Goldmark of CBS and his colleagues were in the final stages of a project on which they had long been secretly working. Toward the end of 1948, the record companies and the union came to terms. The settlement was celebrated with the making of a unique record by an eminent, if unrehearsed, chorus, which included Fran Warren and Perry Como, Lawrence Tibbet, and his Metropolitan Opera colleagues, Marilyn Cutlow, Jan Pierce, and Thomas Hayward. There is no one to whom we would rather help dedicate this first recording in 1948 than to you, a fellow musician and a great president. If you will pardon my rewording of a familiar wish, may I say to you, a Merry Christmas and a Truman New Year. future beckoned with promise. Manufacturers, looking forward to taking up where they had left off at the peak of the fabulous record boom, bustled into production with their brightest stars, like Eddie Duchin. Thank you. 
business in the retail store started out briskly. Columbia had successfully unwrapped its project. A long playing record with over 20 minutes of music to the side. The first major technical advance in the industry since the start of electrical recording. Then RCA Victor cut loose with a revolution of its own. A new slow speed record, which like Columbia's, was a striking improvement in tone quality over anything available earlier. But to play both types, as well as the old style record, would require three different turntable speeds. As record fans stopped buying to look around and make up their minds, panicky dealers began unloading their standard speed albums, despite the industry's promise that these would not become obsolete. But with prices coming down and the quality of recording going up, the general public stands to gain eventually whatever happens within the industry. And no matter how the war of the turntables may go, the public can always be depended upon to respond to one simple formula. The ever magical combination of a good tune and a good performer on a good record. The best single guarantee of the record industry's future is the unfailing wealth of talent ever at its command. Time marches on.